Firstly, why is it that we should have seen this pandemic coming a mile off? And spoiler alert, some of us did. Secondly, why is it that the next pathogen that comes along may well be far more ominous than what we've seen in COVID-19? And I'm not trying to be melodramatic, but there's good reasons to believe that. And then finally, why is it that I'm optimistic? I believe that we're gonna go into the next pandemic far better prepared than we were for this one. Stay tuned and find out. Record. Here's me in 2016 talking about future pandemics. My lifetime, there's been a number of what we call novel zoonotic outbreaks. These are microbes that jump from animals to humans. We've never seen them before. We don't see them coming. Things like HIV, the Ebola virus, MERS-CoV, SARS. This is arguably the most important existential threat facing humanity today. And again, here's me in 2018 talking about future pandemics. Risk of pandemic, the likelihood of there being a global pandemic has increased substantially over the last century. It's important to note that in each case, we've simply just been lucky. We were lucky that the swine flu wasn't as deadly as we know pandemic flu can be. We were lucky that MERS-CoV doesn't easily transmit between humans. And we were lucky that the Ebola virus is not an airborne virus. The truth is that it's just a matter of time before our luck runs out. So in the build-up to COVID-19, I could not have been more vocal about the fact that I believed that a pandemic was due and that I believed we needed to do more in terms of preparation. Let's talk about the reasons why we were at risk of a pandemic before COVID-19 hit and why all of those reasons still exist today and in actual fact some of them are much worse. Firstly, population density, right? And that's a problem that is getting worse. And if there was a bug with pandemic potential, the ability of that bug to transmit from person to person is increased because of population density. With population density, I'm gonna add increased international travel. So if there was an outbreak in one country, the, the ability of that bug to get into another country at this point in time to cross borders is more than at any point in history. Secondly, there's been an increase in human animal proximity, and that's really a function of farming. Thirdly, and if you'll believe it, that's actually a picture of a tree, uh, there's deforestation and climate change. Of course, as you have deforestation, there's opportunities for microbes that we may not have been exposed to before coming out of the woodwork, so to speak. And of course, with climate change, we know that, for example, uh, there are microbes and there are vectors like mosquitoes that are living in places that they may not have otherwise because of a change in climate. Also, with, with uh, melting of the permafrost in Russia, for example, we don't know what frozen microbes may emerge out of that kind of environment. So climate change deforestation definitely increases the risk of zoonotic outbreaks or some sort of microbe with pandemic potential coming out of the woodworks and finally this drawing over here that looks like the sun is actually me trying to draw a virus it's not a very good drawing but really what i'm trying to get at here is cheap technology that enables the development of bioweapons is at an all-time high right it's cheap technology and it's easier to use every year we're seeing breakthroughs in this area and the geopolitical landscape that we live within at the moment certainly disposes to discontent non-state actors we don't know who's going to do what watching out for bioterrorism certainly is at is high on my list of priorities so now i want to talk a little bit about why i believe that the next pathogen that could emerge could be much worse than COVID 19 and i'm not trying to be melodramatic or alarmist I completely understand that COVID-19 has been difficult for a lot of people and I don't want to take away from that. But I do want us to have a realistic sense of what the future might hold and, and, and do everything we can to get ready for that. Hang on, hold the phone, stop watching this video immediately. I just want to say a huge thank you to the University College Cork for providing support for the creation of this video. Now, if you're thinking of studying public health, think about UCC and I'm going to give you a couple of excellent reasons why. So the first reason is the staff and the faculty. These are world-class academics. They're absolutely amazing public health practitioners as well. I know them personally, so I can vouch for these people and I know for a fact that they go to enormous lengths to make sure that their students are given the best possible education in public health available. Reason number two is because UCC already has a reputation for providing this high quality teaching in public health, it attracts to itself high caliber students. These are the people that'll be your circle of friends for a year. And importantly, these are the people that'll be your professional network going forwards in the rest of your career. Now UCC offer both a BSc in Public Health Science or an MPH program that can be done in person or online. So you've got options, go check it out. There's a link in the description below this video. So there's four sort of domains or quadrants that we need to think about when we think about the possible impact of a pathogen in terms of pandemic potential. And these domains are firstly transmission dynamics, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, disease dynamics, okay, our immunological response, and the mutation rates within the virus. And I'm gonna talk about all of these briefly. 
So there's two things when we think about transmission dynamics that we need to think about, and this is how things spread. The first is where does it come from, right? The spark risk, where does this thing originate? And it could be a virus, it could be bacteria, it could be a prion. There's a number of possibilities, but what is the origin? There's two that I'm mostly concerned about, and the first is zoonotic, and we've talked about that, animal to humans, right? Bugs that we're not used to that were living in animals get transmitted into a human. And then with that transmission to human, because that happens all the time, by the way, that there's also the possibility of human to human spread, right? So that's zoonotic outbreaks with pandemic, pandemic potential. And the second, and I mentioned a little earlier, is the risk of bioterrorism, right? So that's spark risk, and there's things that we can do to mitigate that. The second is, how does this thing spread? Okay, and there's a number of ways that these things can spread, and I'm gonna go through them just very quickly with you. Okay, so there could be waterborne and foodborne transmission. There can be airborne or droplet spread, and those are slightly different, and I'm not going to get into that in this video. Physical contact, bloodborne, sexual contact, bodily fluids is another way that things spread. And then finally, mother to child transmission through intrauterine or perinatal spread. Next, let's talk about the disease dynamics themselves, right? If a person gets exposed to and gets infected with a bug, what might happen and how does that matter, right? And here in the, here, I've just drawn two lines. And then the, the bottom line is, let's imagine that this is the line that represents when it is that you might become infectious, right? So you get infected, and in the first half of the line, we call that the latent period, during which you're not spreading the virus at all. So you're not infectious, the virus is latent. And then after that, you become infectious, right? That's an infectivity period, right? And then the line above that is the extent to which you're symptomatic, right? And we call the first half of that line the incubation period. So you don't have any symptoms, you feel perfectly well. And then after that, you have symptoms. Now, what's interesting about these two lines is this little overlap right over here. There's often a period of time during which a person has become infectious, but they're not yet symptomatic, right? So you get asymptomatic spread. And that's extremely important when it comes to the way a virus may spread because of, of the fact that a person doesn't know that they're sick at all. So if you take, for example, HIV, people with HIV lived for a long period of time feeling perfectly well and spreading the disease and only toward the end of the disease became sick, realized that they had you know, AIDS-defining illnesses, and, uh, and, then, and then of course that hampered the, you know, the, the extent to which the, the, the disease would spread from that point onwards. Now, of course, HIV is very different and we've got antiretroviral drugs, but at the beginning of the HIV pandemic, that was certainly a big problem. Compare that to, for example, SARS. Right During the SARS outbreak 2003, SARS made people very sick quite quickly and and there wasn't this big overlap between becoming symptomatic and becoming infectious. And so we were able to identify the people that had SARS at the point in time that they were just becoming infectious and they became very sick, so they, they were quite easy to identify. And so we were actually able to contain SARS, which we were very lucky. Okay, so that's the disease dynamics. These last two I'm not going to talk about at length, I'm just going to mention them to be complete. Firstly, your immunological response. So having been infected and recovered, for how long do you remain protected because of your immunological response or following a vaccine, how long do you remain protected by the vaccine? That's very important in terms of our ability to respond to a pandemic. And then finally, the extent to which a virus mutates, how quickly it mutates, that of course has, and we've seen, we're have seen we seeing it with COVID-19, as you get new variants, it impacts on our entire sort of response to the pandemic. COVID-19, by the way, compared to other viruses, is a very slow mutator, or it's got built-in factors that protect itself from mutations. But there certainly are viruses out there that would mutate much, much, much faster than COVID-19. Now, the combination of all of those factors translates, and each of them contributes to these two factors that I think are the determinants of whether or not a pathogen is particularly scary or not. That's R0, and I'm going to explain what that is in a minute, and case fatality rate. Okay, let's get into these. Now, R0 is the number of additional people that a case will infect in a totally susceptible population. So it really is telling us how infectious this particular disease is. And the case fatality rate is the proportion of the cases that actually die of the disease. So in the case of COVID-19, right, the wild type, the original version of COVID-19 before the, the, the mutations was about two. It changes from place to place because it depends on things like social dynamics, et cetera, et cetera. But it was about, let's say it was about two. And with the Delta variant, which is out at the moment, let's say it's about five. The reason this number is important is it also helps us calculate how many people need to be immune to get to herd immunity, which is really where, where we want to get with any kind of, kind of pandemic. There's a little formula, and I've got another video that talks you through how to do the calculation, so don't worry about it now, but the formula is R0 minus 1 over R0 times 100 gives you the percentage of people that need to be 
we sometimes say vaccinated, but it's actually immune. So it's a combination of vaccinated or immune from previous infections. Um, so when the virus was two, when the, when the R0 was two, right, two minus one over two means 50% of the population needed to be immune to get to herd immunity. A small change in R0, so just going up to five, five minus one over, is four over five means 80% of the population need to be immune in order to get to herd immunity with the delta, with, with the R0 to 5. So a small change in the R0 actually makes a huge difference in the extent to which we're able to combat the disease. Now, how bad can things get with respect to R0? How bad is COVID-19? How does it compare to other diseases? Well, just to give you a benchmark, measles has got an R0 of 18, right? Measles is about as bad as the, anything that's out there in terms of infectivity, but that's how bad things can get, right? So when we start thinking what might come out of the woodwork, might, what might we face in the future, this is the range. I mean, we might get something with an R0 of like between two and five, and that's pretty bad, but we might get something with an R0 as high as 18, or maybe even worse. We don't know what's out there. So the case fatality rate for COVID-19, let's say, was between about half and 1%, but that varies a lot, population to population. What access to healthcare you've got, where in the pandemic you got infected, at different points in time there are different treatments available, did you have a pre-existing condition, what age were you, et cetera, et cetera. So it's difficult to say, you know, but broadly speaking, let's say that it was in the neck, in, in the neck of the woods of between half and 1% for COVID-19. Now let's talk about other viruses that are out there and how bad things could get, right? So COVID-19, let's say it had a case fatality rate of one, maybe even a little bit more, right? SARS virus, also a coronavirus, okay? Case fatality rate of 10%, right? So at least 10 times more. MERS-CoV, another coronavirus, right? Case fatality rate, 30%, right? Uh, the Nipah virus, case fatality rate, 60%, right? So th things can get much, much, much worse. Ebola virus, case fatality rate between 70 and 90%. Granulomatous amoebic encephalitis, 90% case fatality rate. Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease, which is a prion disease, 100% case fatality rate. Rabies, 100% case fatality rate. African trypanosomiasis, 100% case fatality rate. Visceral leishmaniasis, 100% case fatality rate. So I want you for a moment to imagine a pandemic where the R0 was, let's say, 10, and the case fatality rate, let's say, was 50%. What would that really mean? All of the things and the tools that we've used to get through this pandemic, right? The fact that we can get groceries delivered, that we've got Amazon Prime and we've got uh, Netflix, that we can use Team and Zooms and all sorts of ways to communicate. All of these things, to a certain extent, require an element of the companies that make these things happen to be able to get up out of bed and go to work some people have to physically be there. And in a pandemic where you've got an R0 of, of, of 10 and a case fatality rate of 50%, nobody's leaving their house. All of those things fall apart. Eventually, even the fact that you can switch on a tap and get fresh water to drink becomes threatened. And how long would it take after the fresh water has stopped coming out of your taps? How thirsty would you have to get for this fragile thing called civil society and civilization to absolutely disintegrate in front of your eyes? And if you don't think that that would happen with an R0 of 10 and a case fatality rate of 50% and you're a little bit more optimistic than me about those kind of parameters, pick another number because anything is possible here. And I suppose the point that I'm trying to make is this, without trying to be too melodramatic, although there's no way around that given what I'm about to say, we could well face a pandemic that could end the existence of humans altogether. And I really am hoping that we've ended this whole conversation about whether or not investing in a good public health infrastructure is good value for money. I mean, that shouldn't be a question at all. So then why is it that I'm actually quite optimistic, despite what I've just said? Why do I believe that in actual fact going forwards, when we're faced with the next pandemic, we will be better prepared than we have been for this one? Okay, let's get into that right now. So lessons learned from this pandemic that I think are really going to go a long way to helping us prepare for the next pandemic are things that I think we're going to do differently and better at a global, national, and regional level. And I'll just go through some of these briefly with you. Things that we're going to do much better at a global level are, number one, we're going to do a faster turnaround in terms of vaccine production. Now, I know we produced a vaccine really quickly this time around, and there's no criticism of that. That was amazing. But I think in future pandemics, we're going to do even better. There's plans afoot to make sure that we can produce a vaccine from start to ready to go in the market within 100 days. And I think that will, really, that will be a massive game changer. Next, I think there's going to be a big look at the IHR, the International Health Regulations. The IHR have actually been extremely important in this pandemic and in previous pandemics, and this is not a criticism of the IHR, but I do think that there's going to be opportunities to do things better and to work faster within that framework, and I think there's going to be really important changes made within that space. I'm not going to get into it in this video. I'll make another video about that at some point in time in the future. 
And finally, at a global level, the thing we're going to do much, much better at is spark risk surveillance. So spark risk is wherever we think that there's a potential for a spark, kind of a new pathogen that has pandemic potential. And surveillance is going to require lab and epidemiological capabilities in the places where spark risk exists. Okay, And, and I think we're going to do much better, better at that. And there are plans afoot to put that in place. Next, at a national and regional level, we're going to go into the next pandemic much, much better prepared. All right. And there's two aspects to that. Firstly, we need to, within countries, figure out what are the things that we do better at a national level, what things should be centralized and which you don't want to replicate in, in every single region within a country. And what are the things that need to be regionalized? What should be done at a regional level? Where are the departments of public health able to respond better because they've got that local knowledge, for example, nursing homes uh, and outbreaks? Okay, and how is it that you can facilitate them with the best epi epidemiological data that enables them and empowers them to do that public health response? Right, we're going to go into the next pandemic much, much better prepared. We're going to have things in place like a national contact tracing mechanism in in place ready to go if we get hit by another pandemic we're going to push a button and we'll be able to mobilize all sorts of capabilities right there and then in short this pandemic despite how terrible it's been and i and i'm conscious of the fact that a lot of people have suffered a lot of people have died a lot of people have lost loved ones but despite how terrible it's been this has been the awakening that we've needed to get ourselves ready for what might be a much more sinister threat down the line if you found this video interesting or useful please subscribe remember to share this video with other people that might find it useful and stay and watch another video take care don't do drugs always do your best don't ever change speak to you soon bye